All right, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, so I'm really sorry for not coming in person to Paris and to IHS. Uh, it would be great to see all you in person, but hopefully one day I will be there. And yeah, I'll try my best uh, doing it online. So again, if you have any questions, I guess Andre will translate the question to me. And I'm not sure I will monitor Q&A. I'm not sure I'll look at raised hands. So please ask questions out loud. Uh, okay. So the plan for, so there will be five lectures and the plan is uh, to start slowly. So today will be mostly definition of kavanagh frazanski homology. What is this thing? Uh, give some examples. And mostly it would look like something quite formal commutative algebra exercise. So first of all, I have to say, and I'll say it again in a couple of minutes that I will talk about some link invariants. I guess none of you are really topologists uh, and neither am I. Uh, so I will try to explain that this is not really a topological problem that we're talking to. Like you can phrase everything in pure terms of commutative algebra. And I'll give a lot of examples like how to define this homology, how to compute this homology, slightly more complicated examples, and what we know and what we don't know about it. Then in the next lecture, I'll talk about braid varieties. And for a large class of braids and for a large class of links, this is actually a very explicit geometric model for computing or at least defining this homology. So roughly speaking, you would have an algebraic variety and the homology of this algebraic variety uh, will be kavanagh frazanski homology with some subtleties, which I will explain next time. Uh, then on lecture three, I will talk about slightly more subtle structures uh, and homological operations in this homology. So this homology, unlike homology of topological space has no multiplication. But there are lots of interesting homological operations and there are tautological classes or analogs of those which are familiar to many people in the audience. And there is this fine operation of deformation or wification of this homology. And I will explain like how to work with this and how to compute a lot more examples with these techniques and these operations and prove some interesting results. Uh, in the fourth lecture, I'll talk about algebraic links. That's even smaller class of links, but there is a very interesting connection to plane curve singularities, affine Springer theory, and some structures and some uh, varieties that will appear are very actually closely related to the course by Joel Kamenser on uh, the affine Springer theory because that's very, very related. Uh, and finally, in the last lecture, I'll talk about the Hubert scheme of points on the plane which I guess is mostly familiar to most people uh, here in the audience and how that is connected to link homology. So there will be lots of different models, how to use commutative algebra or algebraic geometry to understand what's going on with this homology. So this is the idea. And before all this, I just want to spend a couple of minutes and talk like what do we mean by a link invariant and how to build a link invariant and what is a link if you haven't seen it. So, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to start with the Bray group. So the Bray group is a group with generators sigma one through sigma n minus one and the relations written here. So sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i is sigma i plus one, sigma i, sigma i plus one. And sigma i, sigma j is uh, sigma j, sigma i, if i and j are far apart. So I think many people have seen this group. And one should think about sigma i uh, as a simple crossing between, so I have n strands and I cross i's and i plus first strand and I choose this to be the positive crossing. So this would be sigma i. And if I have a sigma i inverse, this would be the opposite crossing. And so by vertical stacking of such pictures, uh, we can get arbitrary braid. So that should be familiar for, to most people. Maybe less familiar thing for uh, algebraic geometers is the two theorems of Alexander and Markov. So Alexander's theorem says that any link you can actually obtain as a closure of some braid. So here alpha is an arbitrary three strand braid and I can close it up like this. So I just join the ends of the braid on top and on the bottom and they connect like this. This is a closed diagram with no ends and this is a link possibly with several components depending on uh, the braid alpha, you could have three components, you could have two components, you could have one component in this picture, depending on the permutation corresponding to alpha. 
For example, if alpha is the identity braid, so nothing happens here, and then I just have three circles. So this is a link with three components. Uh, and then slightly more subtle theorem of Markov says that uh, we can say when two braids uh, give the same link. So two braids close to the same link, if and only if they're related by the following moves. So I can relate alpha beta and beta alpha. So this is equivalent to conjugation of a braid. So I can just take this part of the braid, slide it down. So when I slide it to the right, you will get alpha upside down. When I slide it again, I will have alpha upside up. And so these two links are clearly the same. And then if I have alpha is a braid on n strands, I can add one more strand over here. Mark this. So this is a new strand. And then I add a crossing marked in red circle. And that crossing could be positive or negative. And again, here I change the number of strands. So let me mark this like this. So I go from two strands to three strands, but it's clear that I can undo this kink and the resulting link will be the same. And so these two operations of conjugation and what is called positive and negative stabilization, they don't change the link, uh, but they change the braid obviously. And so, in particular, the second operation would change the number of strands. You could have two different braids with different number of strands, which close up to the same link. And so uh, given all this, so let me uh, give like a rough plan for everything what will happen. So we're interested in a topological link invariant. So we have a link, which is uh, something some curve in three dimensions, but we don't regard it as a curve in three dimensions. We want to get more algebraic structures there. And so first of all, we present this link as a closure of a braid. Then uh, to define a successful link invariant, what do you need to say? You need to say that something is assigned to crossing. So for each crossing, positive or negative, we assign something and this something will depend on the context, of course. Then this something, should satisfy braid relations, which I wrote in the beginning. So sigma i, sigma i plus one, and sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i, and so on. And so if this happens to satisfy braid relations, then automatically we get a braid invariant. So for any braid, however we write it as a product of generators, we get something invariant. And this is not enough to build a link invariant. So to build a link invariant, we need to define describe some operation, how to close a braid. And this, you should think of it as some kind of trace in more or less abstract sense. But anyway, so you have a braid and you have to explain what does it mean to close a braid. Uh, and then for this operation of closure, you need to check additional invariants under conjugation and stabilization under Markov moves. So that uh, whatever, product of generators you assign to alpha beta and to beta alpha, they could be different, but once you close the braid, the results are the same. And the same thing here. So these are different braids, alpha and alpha with this extra yellow strand. Uh, so there will be different invariants of braids and they would live in different categories if you want. But then once you close the braids, this operation should give the same result. And that is just a formal consequence of the general theorems of Alexander and Mark. And so what I need to explain for you is how to assign something to crossing, verify braid relations, and then describe this operation of closing a braid, which is, I would say, a separate part of the construction. Not only checking braid relations, but what does it mean to close a braid? Uh, and that's pretty much it for the general outline. So sometimes it's also useful to restrict yourself to some subclasses of braids, for example, just positive braids when you don't have negative powers. And maybe you want to also restrict your invariants. So you can say maybe we're interested in braid invariants, which are only invariant under conjugation, but don't, but are not preserved by Markov moves, for example, by stabilization. There are lots of these invariants. Uh, we can also ask about uh, invariants, and we'll see them today and next time, which are invariant under conjugation and only positive stabilization, but not invariant under negative stabilization. And so this won't give you a topological invariant, 
uh, but for many purposes, it's still uh, very good and very interesting to study. And maybe let me pause here and ask if there are any questions about this kind of very general plan, how to build link invariants. Any questions? Okay, so if there are no questions, let's actually go to actual uh, algebra. So we start with the ring R, and this is a polynomial ring in n variables, x1 through xn. And there is an action of symmetric group which permutes the variables uh, in obvious way. And we will consider bimodules over this ring. So to every braid, we will associate a bimodule or a convex of bimodules over this ring. So the most elementary bimodule that we will consider is called bi. Uh, so this is r tensor r over r si. So si is a transposition of i and i plus one. And so this r si, uh, let me write it down maybe. So these are really si invariant functions. Oops, sorry. Okay. Fine. So r si are si invariant function on r. And so, in particular, if I have axes, xi, x1 through xn will be elements and generators of this R. X primes will be the generators of the other R. And so, what are the SI invariant functions? So, we require that xi plus xi plus one is equal to xi prime plus xi plus one prime. So, this is an invariant function under transposition of i and i plus one. So, the action of this element on the left is equal to the action of this symmetric function on the right. The action of xi, xi plus one on the left is equal to the action of xi prime, xi plus one prime on the right. And then the action of xj is equal to the action of xj prime uh, on the left and on the right, uh, provided that j is not equal to i and a plus one. So all these j's are clearly invariant under this transposition. And sometimes it's useful to draw, so I won't draw a lot of stuff because it's really more algebraic course, but uh, sometimes people like to draw this as the following picture. So I have axis on the bottom, x1 through xn, x primes on the top, x1 prime uh, up to xn prime. And then what happens is that xi and xi plus one, they merge together, and then they split into xi prime and xi plus one prime. But when they merge and they split, you don't know if uh, they stay the same or they're permuted uh, and transposed. And so only things that you know are symmetric functions are preserved. So symmetric functions in Xi are the same as symmetric functions in Xi and Xi plus one are the same as symmetric functions in Xi prime and Xi plus one prime. And so this is a bimodule. And again, you can think of kind of the left action of R as sitting on the bottom of this picture and the right action of R on the top. And this is a bimodule. Uh, so any questions about this bimodule? OK. And so, so be, uh, Eugene, I, I just wanted to say, I mean, I think it's a good point to say that the, the picture you drew with the x's and the x prime is just like a, a picture for intuition. And the, the actual definition of bi is the tensor product on the left. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So th this is, again, you can think of like the way the most explicit way to think about this is either this tensor product or you have uh, polynomials. So maybe I should write it down if it will let me. Okay, I, I won't be able to write it down, but it's fine. So I have polynomials in x's and x primes quotiented by these relations over here. And uh, an exercise, if you haven't seen this thing before, is you can tensor bimodules over R. So BI is a bimodule. So I have a left action and I have the right action. And this BI is also a bimodule. I can tensor them over the middle R and get again a bimodule over R on the left and R on the right. And as tensor product of bimodules, this actually splits as BI plus BI. And this is uh, one of the exercises and you can check it in the exercise session. And another exercise to get familiar with these bimodules is that there are very interesting maps of bimodules from bi to r. So r is a bimodule over r itself. 
Uh, and there are maps of bimodules from Bi to R and from R to Bi. And uh, these maps are explicitly constructed in the exercises. So you can check, and this is kind of the most uh, explicit thing that you can compute about this. So given these maps, you can take the cones and form two term complexes of R, R by modules. And I will call them TI and TI inverse. So TI is the cone of BI to R, and TI inverse is the cone from R to BI. And again, like so far, everything is really formal. These are just complexes of bimodules. And, oh yeah, now it's right. So uh, now the main theorem here, since we're discussing braids and braid closures, is a theorem for Kia, who proved uh, about 20 years ago, I guess, that TI and TI inverse satisfy braid relations up to homotopy. So you have this complex of RR by modules. You assign this to a generator of the braid group and to the inverse of this generator. And then you can tensor them over R. So all these tensor products are over R. And maybe I'll stop writing over R for a while. But all these things are tensor products of complexes of by modules. So for example, here, this is a two term complex. And so I tensor it with another two term complex. So as written, it will be four term complex. And again, it's a very interesting exercise to check that this TI tensor TI inverse is R. And so uh, maybe I'll do it over here and just give you an indication of what's going on. So if B goes to R, I tensor with the two term complex where R goes to B, I get a four term complex where I get uh, B tensor R is B. Here in the middle, I have R plus B squared. And then here I have another B. So this is just the tensor product of these two things. And then I use this exercise over here that B times B is B plus B. And then you can use it to simplify. So basically this B square cancels out with this B and this B. And again, if you want to get a flavor of what's going on with these bimodules and these complexes, please do this exercise because uh, this is really helpful. And checking braid relations is slightly more complicated, but not too much. And so uh, as a consequence, for any braid on N strands, we get a complex of R bimodules, which is well-defined up to homotopy. Question? Okay, so uh, we just tensor these things to generators because the uh, there is some echo by some reason. Okay, uh, so we tensor these two term complexes for generators and we get a giant complex for the whole braid. So uh, the number of terms in this uh, complex will be two to the number of uh, crossings of your braid. And then uh, because of these relations, it's well-defined up to homotopy equivalence. So this is called Rukia complex for a braid. And there are a couple of remarks which are not so important, but I want to say anyway. May I ask a question again? Yes, please. Okay, you can hear me, right? So how do you define this uh, T beta again? Uh, I didn't quite understand. Uh, so I have a beta. I write it as a product of generators. Maybe it was, I, oh, oh, okay, okay. and then I just replace it with TI1 in the power plus minus tensor and tensor TIR in the power plus minus. Uh, and so this is a giant complex. So this is a two to the R term complex. And this tensor product is again tensor product over R. And uh, because the braid relations are satisfied after homotopy equivalence, this giant tensor product of complexes is still well defined. And it doesn't matter how we write beta as a product of generators. So the result is a well defined complex of our bimodules up to homotopy equivalence. Does this uh, really, uh, braiding, braid relations also imply that you have some kind of a braid action on a, on a Category of more uh, R modules or 
Yes, you can say that you have a break group action, but this is a monoidal category, so you can just tensor things. So you can tensor on the right, for example, on all this. Whenever you have a complex of bimodules, you can tensor it on the right with arbitrary R bimodule. And with some care, you get a break group action R modules on the left or on the right. That's right. But yeah, this is the key thing that you can define this uh, TI and they satisfy braid relations. So you do have a braid group action in this sense. Okay, any other questions? All right, uh, so a couple of remarks just to say some words. And again, we don't need these details to keep going. Ah, and I'll give an example of this construction in a minute. So just, uh, Stay put, and then I'll explain like how to actually do some things in this example. Uh, so uh, BI and the tensor products, they generate a very specific category, which is known as the category of Zorgel bimodules. So formally speaking, so how do you define Zorgel bimodules? You can take all possible BIs, all possible tensor products of BIs, and all possible direct semantics in tensor products. So you take Caribe completion. Uh, and it turns out that this category is much smaller and much more interesting than uh, just all RR bimodules. And it categorifies the Hecke algebra and it has lots of other beautiful properties and lots of people study this these days. And so you can definitely say that T beta is complex of RR bimodules, but it's also a complex of Zorgil bimodules. So if you like geometric representation theory, uh, the best way to think about it is that to say that this is really a complex of Zorgil bimodules, but we don't, we won't really need it, I think, for most of uh, this course. So I won't discuss this because I don't want to introduce too much notation. And another thing that lots of people like to ask uh, is that this can be defined for any uh, type, for any Coxter group, in fact. So the same definition just works for any Coxter group. Uh, acting in some representation by reflections uh, because you just define this BI and you proceed. So you have SI is the generator of a Coxter group and you proceed this way. And you have a beautiful theory of the Zorgel by module for arbitrary Coxter groups developed by Zorgel, Elias, Williamson, and many other people. Uh, and you get the action of the corresponding braid group by uh, these Rukia complexes. So this generalizes and you satisfy braid relations of the corresponding type, corresponding to your uh, Coxter group. And uh, this is all very nice and well behaved in all types. Okay, and so the next piece of information uh, is how to close the braid. So we defined an interest in braid invariant. This is a complicated thing. It's not a number, it's not a vector space, it's a complex of bimodules. And we need to explain how to close the braid. And to close the braid, we use the notion of Hochschild homology. And uh, I mean, many people here are much smarter than me. So of course, you know by heart what is Hochschild homology. Uh, so roughly speaking, you resolve each our term by free RR bimodial. and identify uh, xi with xi prime in the resolution, and then you take homology. But I won't spend too much time on this definition. And in fact, I'll use a special case of it, which I'll say maybe right now, actually, that uh, one special case of Hochschild homology, which is really easy to explain for everyone, is just this. So you hh upper zero, this is Hochschild cohomology. It's dual to Hochschild homology in this case. So this is just home of bimodules from R, from the uh, diagonal bimodule to X. So if I want to come, if I, some of you don't know what Hochschild homology or Hochschild cohomology is, you can always think about just this HH0. So HH0 of X is home from R to X. And this is well-defined for any bimodule so this is home in the category of bimodules. Oops. Uh, 
And we will see examples of this Holmes very soon. And so starting from a braid, what do we actually do? So we start from a braid, we assign this two-term complex to every crossing. We assign the product of these two-term complexes to any braid. And this will be this T beta. And this is a complex of our bimodules. And then you either apply uh, Hochschild homology, if you like it, or if you don't know what Hochschild homology is, just apply this home from R to every term of this complex. And you have to do it to every term. So there are lots of terms in this complex, do it term wise. Uh, and then you will get a complex of R modules because if X was an RR by module, form from R to X is an R module. Uh, and the resulting complex of R modules is essentially your invariant or more precisely you take homology of the resulting complex of R modules. And this is what is known as HHH of beta. So you first take HH for Hochschild homology of T beta, and then you take homology of that thing. So this is a pretty uh, involved construction, and it has two very different steps. So the first is constructing this complex, then applying Hochschild homology, and then if you want to homology of that. Yeah, and then the mysteriously, huh? question? Is the complex uh, itself uh, invariant or? Uh, in what sense? I mean, like, as our modules know, because, for example, the number of variables uh, is the number of strands in your braid, and so it can't be invariant. Uh, but if you just regard it as a complex of vector spaces, yeah, sure, because it's like up to homodop is the same as its homology, so it doesn't matter. But as a complex of our modules, unfortunately, it's not invariant. You can have some uh, remains of this uh, structure. So you have slightly more than just the complex of vector spaces. And we'll talk about this uh, probably on Wednesday. Uh, but for now, we just forget all the structure, take homology and regard this homology as the vector space. Is it clear how this complex changes under this conjugation and uh, stabilization operations? Yes. Or does that make sense? Yes, 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 yes. So all this is known. So in particular, a theorem of Kavanov and Rosansky says that uh, if you just take this homology of HH, this is a link invariant. So this is really invariant under conjugation and uh, stabilization. And so it doesn't, so up to maybe some grading shift, which I will suppress, but this is really, really link invariant. If you want to understand this as a complex of our modules, uh, it's still invariant under conjugation. That's true. Uh, because basically Hochschild homology is some kind of categorical trace. And so it doesn't matter if you take uh, homology of X tensor Y or Y tensor X. Uh, it, and you can say what happens with stabilization concretely. And maybe I won't see it right now, but uh, there are explicit formulas which say what happens if you have some complex of bimodules, then you add an extra strand, add a crossing, and what happens to HHH of that. So that is understood, that's right. So and homology as like some functor from the Dirac category of bi modules to the Dirac category of R modules or uh, from homotopy category. So I, I never go to Dirac category of R bi modules. I always work with homotopy category of bi modules. And there are some mm, subtle technical reasons why I want to do this, but uh, I guess one reason is that the category of surrogate by models is not really um, uh, abelian, it's just additive, and you have to be very careful with talking about the right category of that. But like, again, practically what happens is that you just have a complex of uh, by models, it lives in the homotopy category, and then you apply this HH, which is an additive hunter to every term, and that's it. Okay, and so, uh, I mean, so far, this is just a vector space. This vector space is triply graded. And what are the gradings? So the first grading is that an internal grading on all bimodules. Uh, so uh, every bimodule BI is naturally graded. If you scroll up, okay, some issues here. So all these equations anyway were homogeneous. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so all these equations that we had before were homogeneous. Yes, xi plus xi plus one is xi prime plus xi plus one prime and so on. 
And so all these bimodules are naturally graded. Uh, and we assume that the degree of xi is equal to 2. So this is the capital Q grading on these things. Then, because we are talking about complexes, we have a homological grading. And this will be denoted by capital T. And then, because we take Hochschild homology for every term, uh, this is what is called as A grading. And so, just to repeat, so if we want to, if we don't like higher Hochschild homologies, because they are kind of harder to think about, you can just think about this home from R to X. And this corresponds to picking one specific A degree in this triply graded homology. So this is a degree zero. And we will often just restrict to this part because it's so much easier to explain what's going on. You don't need to do this Hochschild homology business. And from all the phenomena that I will explain, actually, this thing is enough. So you can talk about other HHI, and I'll mention them from time to time. But for most interesting phenomena, for most interesting computations, this is already a very interesting playground of things. So this is, again, just specific. A degree. And uh, just as a caution, so this part is actually invariant under conjugation and invariant under positive stabilization, but it's not invariant under negative stabilization because negative stabilization would kind of shift everything a degree up and you will lose this degree zero piece. But uh, again, for many purposes, this is actually enough. And so this is it. And so this is this recipe, again, that we start from a braid, build this tensor product of complexes, uh, compute social homology, or apply this home from R to blah, and then compute homology. And it's been more than half an hour, and I haven't given you any examples, really. So let me give you an example and work it out in detail. So the braid that I'm talking about is this uh, two-strand braid. So n is equal to 2. And we have two crossings, and we assume that both of these are positive. So actually, if you think about the link, it would close up to the hopped link when I have two circles, which are linked like this. And so to a single crossing, we assign this complex T, which is two-term complex from B to R. So this is just a single crossing. So if you want to define something for this braid, you need to tensor this complex twice. So you have the complex from B to R, you have another complex from B to R, you tensor them over R, and you get a four-term complex where I get B square on the left, two copies of B uh, in the middle, and then R on the right, and I'm ignoring all the grading shifts because that would be too much. Uh, then I'm using the rule that B square is B plus B. So this is happening here. Uh, and uh, we have two B plus B, B plus B here and B plus B here with slightly different gradings. And again, I'm kind of cheating here. Uh, and if you do some constellations, you will see that actually you will leave with one copy of B here and one copy of B in the middle and R on the right. And this is really the minimal complex for T squared. So this is, again, a complex, very explicit complex of uh, RR by modules that you assign to this braid. And then you want to compute to close the braid. So as we discussed, to close the braid, we just apply home from R to every term. So home from R to R is R in by modules. And in fact, home from R to B is also R. So this is generated by that map from R to B that I uh, discussed a little while back. And so we'll get a complex, which is uh, um, R goes to R goes to R. Uh, and this is, again, home from R to B is R, home from R to B is R, and home from R to R is R. Uh, and then we need to compute differentials. And I was kind of sloppy with the differentials here. But in fact, you can compute them. Uh, and this differential will be zero, and this differential will be x1 minus x2. So R is, recall that R is just polynomials in x1, x2. And so finally, we get to some answers. 
So it was this long abstract discussions, but this is a very concrete complex. And I'm sure that anyone here can compute its homology. So the result will be what? It will be R in degree two. Uh, and then you would have R mod X1 minus X2 uh, in degree zero in here and here. And this homology is interesting in particular it's infinite dimensional because you have this copy of R and it has an interesting module structure over R, which is actually in this case, link invariant. Uh, and so, uh, this is an example of, again, HHH A is equal to zero uh, of this link that we're talking about of T squared. And uh, if you have a two strand braid, you can actually do more or less the same computation. So if you have a positive two strand braid, uh, you have a power of T, positive power of T, so you just keep doing this thing repeatedly, tensor them, simplify, use this rule that B squared is B plus B, and it's actually not that bad at all. So in, uh, in examples, uh, in exercises, uh, there are some very explicit examples how to compute things and how to do computations on those trends. Because there is only one copy of B, and it's very easy to use this rule and compute everything there. So you will have some explicit modules over C of X1, X2, uh, and that's that. Then for negative powers of T, it's the same thing, kind of. Well, but the problem you is- You know about this example. Uh-huh. So I just uh, a stupid question. You, you view it as a, you view this uh, as a vector space homology, right? Mm -hmm. not, not as a, so when you take homology, when you take the Hochul homology, it's just a vector space, right? I mean, you can say it's our module. So Hochschild homology of B will be like HH0 of B will be R, for example. So this thing is HH upper zero of B. And I can regard this as our module. So this is like, this is a complex of R modules. And in this case, it actually makes perfect sense to think about this as a complex of R modules. Uh, and so we can just take homology of that. It's still R module. Uh, which is written here. I think it should, should be said that when you take R, if you think of it as a vector space, it's important to think of it as a gradient vector space. That's right. So this is, uh, in this case, so because we ignore uh, A degree, uh, we have still two gradients. So this, uh, again, the degree, Q of X I is equal to two. And then these two guys would live in different T degrees because they correspond to this homological degree. And I would say that capital T. I can leave it, but uh, now. Say it again. And this corresponds to T is equal to two or minus two. I mean, it really depends on shifts and conventions that I want to talk. I don't want to talk about, but uh, you will have this R mod X1 minus X2 here, mm -hmm. and you have this R here, and they're real in different T degrees, and each of them is a graded module because R is graded itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all that happens in the B module category, right? So R is also B module there. Uh, no, these are B modules. So uh, yeah, R is also. no. When we, when we close the braid, when we apply this thing, we don't have bimodule structure anymore. So these are just R modules. So you know, write it down. So these are R bimodules. Uh, and these guys are R modules. And uh, again, in this example, you can actually find like lots of interesting spaces where this is like acquiring homology of some space or homology of some shift on some space. And we'll talk about this. So this example is kind of key to understanding what's going on, I would say. Uh, but this is a really complex of R modules. We kill the bimodule structure when we take the trace, when we take the whole homology. Uh, and so, but we still have well-defined R module structure. We have these two different cements. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, anyway, so this is roughly how this thing works. 
Uh, and the problem for very long time, so all this was known back to the work of Kavanaugh and Rosansky uh, in mean uh, 2000s. And then for about 10 years, uh, there was a huge uh, roadblock because nobody knew how to compute it beyond two strands, more or less. Uh, and the key problem, of course, is that this complex grows exponentially in the number of crossings. And even if you try to compute it for three strands, you will have exponentially large complex of uh, bimodules over polynomial ring and three variables. Then you need to take Hochschul homology. Uh, and then you need to take homology of that. It's really, really messy and really complicated structure. And you have like complicated commutative algebra after all with this axis. And so people really didn't know how to uh, deal with that. But it's uh, kind of a computer could do it in a kind of finite amount of time uh, for, each, for each given frame. So. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you can program it, but the programs would break pretty fast, actually, because I don't know if you have Exponential, uh, yes. <laughs> exponent, I mean, it's exponential number of crossings. So where if you have, I don't know, so T33, uh, you would have some like six crossings. You already have uh, two to the six terms in the complex. And then you need to run all this machinery with HH uh, and this. So this already is a lot, actually. This is already a 64 term by modules over polynomial ring and three variables. So we can do this, but uh, the computer stops pretty fast actually. And so people needed some new computational techniques. And in the remaining uh, time, I want to outline like some very vague idea how this might work. So the key theorem obtained in the several papers by Ben Elias, Matt Hogenkamp, and Anton Menet. Uh, is that uh, this triply graded homology for all positive torus links uh, is actually computable. So this is, first of all, supported in even homological degrees. So all, and this we saw in this example, right? So we have some terms in degree zero and some terms in degree two. And it turns out that for any positive torus link, the homology is supported in always in even homological degrees. Uh, and moreover, they give explicit recursion computing for Ankara polynomials of this homology. And so kind of the state of the art is the recent paper from a couple of years ago, Fogan Kamp and Manet, when they give very, very explicit recursion for all these things. And probably I have to uh, say, what is a torus link? Because maybe not so many people have seen it before. So torus link. We'll see them a lot. So T, K, N. So we have, uh, for example, an N strand braid, which looks like this. And then you raise it to the power key. And then you close it. Uh, and torus links are kind of easiest examples of links. And what uh, these people tell us is that you can actually compute this thing. Uh, and one uh, interesting example, which I will explain more, I guess, on Wednesday again, uh, is that so if you have n and plus one torus link, so you have uh, this braid on n strands and raised into power n plus one. This gives the so called QT Catalan numbers. Uh, which are related to lots of interesting uh, things in uh, algebraic geometry of the Hebrew scheme of the points on the plane uh, and uh, commun algebraic combinatorics of McDonald polynomials. And this confirmed lots of conjectures of myself, Andre, Alexey Blankov, Dick Rasmussen, and Vivek Shand, and many others. So there were lots of conjectures. And again, it was very hard to compute this, but these people made a real breakthrough with computing it and finding some recursive ways to do this. And this is actually also an example of a torus link because this is just two, two torus link. I have this thing on two strands and raise it into power two. And so how did they actually do it? So I just want to give you a very uh, kind of rough idea. And the idea is you have to enlarge your class of things and you really need to consider some complexes of Zorgin bimodules or complexes of R bimodules, actually that's enough. 
Uh, so a theorem of Hogenkamp is that there exists a complex of Zorgel bimodules Kn with the following properties. So first of all, if you add a crossing to this thing on the top or on the bottom, you will get the same thing Kn. So it eats crossings on the top, it eats crossings on the bottom. Uh, if you have this guy and you make this kind of partial closure, so you just take one uh, strand, you close it up, you will have a previous key n uh, with an extra factor of t to the n plus a. Here I'm using small t and small a. I'll explain what it is in a second. And you should think of the second rule really as abbreviation for the following thing. So you have k n plus one, you add an arbitrary braid or arbitrary complex of things on the bottom, let's call it x, uh, and then you close up. So then you close up this extra strand without touching x and you close up all the other strands over here. And this gives you just k n and just x with this extra factor t to the n plus a. So this is again some kind of Markov move for this. In some sense, this is Markov move for k n. What happens if you add a strand? You don't even add a crossing, but you just close it up. This is Markov. And uh, the most interesting property is that if you have Kn and you add an extra strand and wrap it around Kn, uh, then in fact, you can resolve it as a two-term complex where you have Kn plus one and Kn over here with some shift. And there is some interesting differential which potentially can be written down. Uh, uh, and it's important that there is some chain map here such that it's cone, so the cone of this map is homotopy equivalent to the complex on the left. So that's as much as what we want to say. Uh, and if you have K1 with just one strand, uh, then this is just nothing. So you can erase K1. Uh, and here we're using uh, AQT, which are the grading shifts, which are related to capital A, capital Q, and capital C. So these are the standard gradings that I defined before, and this is just some change of variables. So it's not so important. What is important uh, is that you, all homological degree shifts are even. So we're saying that we can resolve this thing by this thing and this thing with even homological grading shifts. And now the game is that you can try to apply these rules and say, well, you have a picture like this, you resolve it by something with this thing and something with this thing. Maybe you apply it again uh, and resolve this thing by some smaller things. And at all times, all these smaller things will appear with even grading shifts. And in the, if this recursion stops, this means that we resolved our complex with a bunch of easy stuff where we know the homology all these things appear with grading shifts and there are some crazy differentials between them which we don't really understand at all. But uh, because the homology is even, uh, the differentials must be zero. And so the associated spectral sequence actually collapses immediately and there are no differentials. And so homology of this guy is really equal to homology of this guy plus homology of this guy with explicit even degree grading shifts. Maybe said differently, if you know that the homology of this guy is even, and if you know that the homology of this guy is even, then uh, homology of this thing is given by long exact sequence between homologies of this and this. And we're saying that uh, the differential between them, the connecting differential is zero because again, everything is even. So kind of the most naive version of this is that uh, whenever you have a topological space paved by even dimensional cells, you know that the homology is just the number of cells. And this is kind of the same thing. So this is a combinatorial technique, it works. So maybe for experts, uh, I'd like to say that this KN is so-called compact categorical Jones Wenzel projector. So if people have seen Hecke algebras, uh, there's an element of the Hecke algebra which looks like this, which eats crossings. Uh, which behaves like this, and which is a kind of an eigenvector for uh, this thing, uh, for this operation of multiplication by just Murphy rate. Uh, but if you haven't seen this, well, these are some combinatorial rules. 
And I think I actually have, so I want to explain what this thing is and then I want to compute. Maybe I'll actually want to compute first because I do have time for this and hopefully it won't crash. So suppose that I want to compute uh, again this guy in a different fashion using this projector, using this key. Oh my goodness. So I can say that this is actually the same thing as K1 over here, because we had a rule that one strand is the same as K1. And then we see that this thing with K1 is actually this picture. So I have extra strand wrapping around the strand with K1. And so I can replace it uh, by this complex, I think this will be k minus one. Here we'll get k two, and here I'll have some like q, k one. And again, I don't know what these things are. So the this recursive method just says that there are some complexes in some weird category which behave like this. And then when we close up. Uh, we know that the closure of this K2 is the same as uh, T plus A times the closure of K1. And this is the same as T plus A times invariant of just a knot, which we can compute. The invariant of the second guy and just the invariant of this thing, which we can also compute. So this will be, I mean, this will be essentially just polynomials in X, or if we have odd variables, we have some extra A, and we have this thing. And what I'm saying is that homology of this thing are supported in even degrees because we just computed this. And homology of this thing are also in even degrees. And in this case, by the argument that I tried to explain, it doesn't matter what the differential between these things is. Uh, and homology of the total thing, because all the grading shifts are even, uh, it's just homology of this plus homology of this. And in the example sheet, in the exercise sheet, there are some explicit problems and explicit answers how to compute this. So this is the idea. And again, in general, what uh, they showed is that this method works. So you can always find some recursive things and you can always find these pieces of Kn and keep growing from K1 to K2 to K3 to so on to compute this homology for all positive torus links, develop a recursion and compute it at least as a triply graded vector space. So this method won't give you anything as R module, but as a triply graded vector space, it works perfectly. Uh, and just another example in slightly different direction, which might be helpful, uh, is this picture of K2, uh, which is uh, this complex R to B to B to R. So K2 can be written explicitly. Uh, so there are some explicit maps of bimodules. Again, this is a complex of RR bimodules. And you can write this complex either as a complex where here you have a negative crossing and here you have a positive crossing. Uh, and there is some chain map between them and you take the cone of that map or as you have R and you have this BBR and as we discussed, BBR corresponds to this uh, braid with two crossings over here. So the, you can think of it as a cone of a map from identity to this uh, BBR. Uh, and this can be used to show that actually this um, eats crossings. And this complex has all the nice properties that we have. And it's pretty explicit complex. 
And I haven't actually seen this uh, in other geometric settings, so it would be very nice to see it very explicitly, but this is it. And as I said, uh, in exercises and Q&A sessions, uh, we can uh, explain how to uh, use this theorem to compute some examples. Uh, and maybe one last thing which I want to say is some general properties. So before we go to all these general uh, things uh, and st structures in homological operations, so some general facts. So first of all, if beta closes to a knot, then this HHH of beta is uh, a finite rank free module over uh, polynomials in just one variable, which is x1 plus xn. If you want. So the action of all xi on HHH of beta is the same. Uh, and so you can think of it as a finite rank free module over polynomials in one variable, or you can think of it as uh, just a finite dimensional vector space when a quotient by this action of CFX1 and C. So more or less, we can take this reduced homology. So this is just a finite dimensional. Oops. Okay, find a dimensional vector space. Uh, and so we can say that this HHH of beta is just HHH reduced tensor with polynomials in X1, X10. Uh, and if beta doesn't if beta closes to a link with several components, HHH uh, of beta is not free. Over R but it's still free over this polynomial ring. And I will explain it properly, I guess, next time. Uh, but the point is that we had this example where HHH of T square is R plus R mod X1 minus X2. So this is definitely not free over R, but it is free over polynomials in X1 plus X2. So sometimes it's useful to consider just this smaller sub ring and restrict to that. And it's always the free module. So you get some piece of structure from there. Uh, but in general, if you want to find dimensional vector space, you can do this, but yeah, it doesn't need to be find dimensional vector space. And we'll see a lot of interesting examples next time. Okay. so. Sorry for all the technical issues uh, and thanks a lot. So that's it for today. Before I ask if anyone has questions, in the last line from item one, it should be CX1 plus dot, 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 plus, yes. Said, right? Yes, yes, yes. Anyone has questions? Uh, we seem to have one online. Uh-huh. How to use Kn? Could we construct a link 
invariant from them? Uh, you can construct a link invariant from Kn, and that is related to so-called colored homology. But like this theorem says that there exists Kn. So this is one example. But in principle, like there is some construction of Kn uh, from this theorem. Like one way to construct it is to say that this Kn plus one, you can express, so you have exact triple of this guy, Kn plus one and this guy with Kn, and then you can reverse the arrow and say that this is actually a cone of connecting map between this guy and this guy. Uh, and then you have to prove all these properties for it, and that's how this goes. But a priori Kn is just some complex of uh, our bimodules. And uh, yeah, so in principle, yeah, you can use it to build colored homology if you want, if you know what colored homology is. But maybe so, it's not so important. If I, so if I understand correctly, can you scroll down just a little bit to the next relation? Yes. So this has relation with the strand that goes around the KN is what allows you to, to compute the HHH of a product of these kind of kinds of loops, right? That's right. So basically, whenever you have a torus node, you have a lot of loops. And somehow you remove one loop at a time. And what you get is not a smaller torus node, but it's kind of a piece of uh, inductive structure. And you get kind of less and less and less loops and less and less and less wrapping around. And like, if you have a cleverly organized induction, you can make sure that this recursion converges to something reasonable. That's right. But or kind of you you remove this loop and this allows you to simplify things. You you have definitely less crossings on the right than on the left. So or generally this method should work not only for torus links but for for positive pure grades, right? You don't know. No, I mean I wouldn't be so bold to say it works for positive pure braids, and I don't think it works for. But it's a very good question when this method actually works. So either a larger class of braids where we can compute things. And uh, whenever when we, we can apply this method, we get something where all homology is supporting even homological degrees. So there are examples of positive pure braids where homology is not even. So that's the first kind of test. But like it's a very interesting question, uh, which many people are interested in. Uh, is like what is the nicest class of braids where the homology is supporting even degrees? Uh, and like torus knots or torus links are one example, but is it true for algebraic braids? Is it true for something else? That's an open question. I have a question. Is there an axiomatic approach to this Kovanov uh, Kozanski homology? Uh, I wouldn't say so. I mean, it, it's again, like this recursion might work or might not work. So if, I mean, it, it works in general, if you know all these differentials over here and kind of differentials where this is a part of a bigger picture. So in this sense, it, it always works. The question is a bit different. Yeah, about the kovanov rosansky homology, is, is there an axiomatic approach to it somehow? So you, so you define it as the Kakoshi um, homology of a certain complex, but can you define it, it axiomatically? But oh, no. I think the answer is just no. Like, again, you have a lot of properties, uh, but I don't think there is like a full set of properties which characterize them completely. And do, does one expect that this to uh, distinguish all the knots, or what should be? Uh, Kind of, uh, kind of, what should I mean? If, if two knots have the same Kovanov-Radovsky homology, what can one? And what's the expectation for for the kernel mm. of this map? I don't know. I mean, I think like they they detect more than just uh, so. I didn't say this, but first of all, you can extract Kovanov polynomial from this homology by taking only the characteristic uh, and. There are examples of nodes where home flap polynomial is the same, but this homology is uh, not the same. So in, in some sense, it's a better invariant. But uh, whether this is an uh, interesting thing for distinguishing nodes, I don't know. And again, the main reason is that it's really hard to compute. So like there are some examples where this is computed, but not so many. But uh, it's a part of... Uh, Topological quantum field theorem, for example, if we have a surface connecting two nodes or cobordism, 
you expect a map uh, in this homology and that's very interesting and you can get a lot of topological information from there. So is there an example of two non-isomorphic knots who have the same homology? I don't know. Mm, I'm not sure. I mean, for Kavanov homology, which is related but slightly different, there are examples. For this one, I don't know if anyone computed, but I'm sure there is, but I don't know if it's known. Excellent. <laughs> Any more questions? Without that, thank you again.